Well, it's a Friday night. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, I think we're at episode 131, so we're, we're, we're keep plugging and plugging away. I and love it. Uh, you know, it's it, it's it's so fun. You know, we we've met on um, Christmas Eve, we met on New Year's Eve, we met on yeah. New Day. Uh, it doesn't matter to us. We do, Friday night. Well, yeah. most Friday nights we try and get this yeah. get this going. So. Um, yeah, happy Thanksgiving, American Thanksgiving to you. That's right. That's right. We also celebrate, well, we don't, but we should, the Canadian. See, I can't believe you don't. So um, John's wife is from Canada, uh, from the same town that I'm actually from in Canada. And we always celebrate um, Canadian Thanksgiving. So I get, Why like, not? Double yeah. Thanksgiving. Why wouldn't you, right? Like, Another chance to drink. I, and, <laughs> and have yeah, Yorkshire pudding and and so before we get too far i better uh, introduce our guest tonight yeah so we've got a wonderful guest tonight uh thank you uh lauren for for taking time out of your schedule to join to join us because i know this is race week for you as well so lauren gauss who is a, a pro retired pro triathlete but it's gonna be fun to hear about her career but yeah now you got me thinking about ro roast beef and yorkshire pie or yorkshire Pudding, right? Isn't that a very Canadian Thanksgiving? Oh, no, we have turkey. Oh, right. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. There you go. <laughs> I've, I've never had those two things for Thanksgiving. We, we have turkey and mashed potatoes and pumpkin pie. And my wife has been t t throwing the wool over my eyes. She knows me from the southern part of Calgary. Yeah. Well, <laughs> welcome, Lauren. And uh, this is great to have you on. Thank you for joining us. And it's fun because you coach some of our local athletes now, too. And uh, it's really fun to see the success that they're having uh, in working with you. So uh, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, maybe we can start off with uh, you giving sort of a big snapshot of your career in triathlon because you've had a really good career in triathlon. I, I couldn't find a start date. Was it 2008 that you turned pro or was it 2000? No, it was 2011. 2011. Okay, good deal. Yeah. And I raced professionally for 10 years. Um, started right after college. Uh, I never, so I've never had a job in my life. My mother was says to this day, like, I don't know what it's like to have a real job. <laughs> real job. Um, exited college. I have a biology major. Um, and um, the plan for me was to go to PA school, physician assistant school, where I got accepted. And then I deferred because um, I wanted to pursue triathlon. And oh. I got an invite to the collegiate recruitment camp in Colorado Springs um, to come out and basically be recruited to be into the pipeline for the Olympics for the ITU circuit. Wow. And that was based off my performance at the collegiate nationals at in college. Um, and I started out a swimmer. I swam my whole life pretty, uh, and you know, seriously got burnt out, went to college, joined a sorority, did the college thing, um, started getting pretty fat. And then <laughs> I was like, I got to start exercising again. So I started running. And I went to Clemson University in South Carolina, and we, the perimeter of the school was exactly 5K. Oh. So I would run that every day. Oh. Um, and then I started timing it and seeing how fast I could do it. And then I started to see how many laps I could do until I got exhausted. And, you know, this pattern continued. Um, and then one day I was like, I should get back in the pool. I missed swimming. And I didn't know about triathlon at the time. Mm -hmm. um, at all. I didn't even know it existed. So I got in the pool. I did 2K. And I was like, that was exhausting. Probably not going to do that again. Um, but later, later on, I started dating this guy who uh, I met him at a bar and he wasn't drinking. And I asked him why he wasn't drinking. And he said he was training for an Ironman. Oh. And I was like, what's an Ironman? I was so intrigued. And he told me, and I was like, well, this sounds like something I could do because I'm a runner now. I run yeah. 5K a day <laughs> and I can swim. So I just need a bike. So long story short, that's how I got into triathlon. Uh, I picked up a um, Jameis Ventura Sport 8-speed road bike. Oh, wow. Yep. We um, all remember our first bikes. <laughs> yep. I paid $600 for it, my own money. 
And uh, I was so happy. So that's how, you know, then I started doing triathlon, joined the the Clemson collegiate club team. I think I was fourth at collegiate nationals. Um, I had upgraded my bike, but I was, I was, gonna say, I was yeah. now on a, a felt B16. I don't, those time trial bikes. And um, yeah, then I started, graduated, did ITU racing for a little while, realized um, I wasn't going to make any money doing that. And I've always been financially driven Mm -hmm. where a lot of people are very passion driven. Um, You know, their goal is to make the Olympics. My goal was to make a career out of sport. Mm -hmm. And I knew doing that ITU route was not going to make me money. Mm -hmm. So I switched over to non-draft racing. And at the time there were a lot of opportunity, Mm -hmm. um, which this don't exist anymore. We had the uh, Lifetime Fitness Series, the Rev3 sure. Series, the 5150 Series, High V, mm-hmm. St. Anthony's, Alcatraz, New York City Tri, like all these great opportunities. I was making great money mm-hmm. racing Olympic distance triathlons, mm-hmm. 15 a year, you know, and I would just race back to back to back. Um, and then eventually I got into 70.3 racing. Um, and I won 11 of those races. Um, and then I never, you know, I never had the itch to do a full Ironman though. Mm. Uh, so I've never, I'm not an Ironman. Oh, you guys probably are. I'm not. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that is, that is quite the background. And we should go back to your swimming, uh, history is you were swimming as a young uh, teenager, 200 butterfly, the mile. I mean, these were some serious swimming events. So you have that, that, uh, swimming background, which I think really pays off in the long term. Oh, for sure. I remember I was 14 years old Mm. on every Christmas break from school. My swim team would have a training camp. Yeah. Right. And we did 10 by 1000 one day at 14 years old, 10 by 1000. I still remember that set to this day. I remember the lane I was in. I remember my water bottle. I remember the girl who was swimming in front of me. Like, I mean, it was intense. Swimming, yeah. swimming is very, very intense sport as a child. And, um, I got really burnt out and I mm-hmm. hated sports and well, I'm still doing sports, but yeah, right. <laughs> but you, you switched directions and that, I, that's really, that's sort of a neat, that is a neat story to hear that you've, you found some other avenues, but talk about your very first triathlon. Yeah, it was in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it was called the Charleston sprint try. It was in like a county park, uh, it feels, you know, a sprint. And I think I got second in my overall female, but I had, um, I couldn't decide if I needed to buy cycling shoes because my transition would probably be too slow. So I was like, I'm just going to wear tennis shoes for the whole, the bike and the run. So, um, that's what I did. And I remember I ran 24 minutes for the 5k off the bike. And I swear to God, that was the hardest off the bike run I've probably done in my life. I finished that race and I was like, I'm never doing this again. That was awful. Um, but you know, you keep doing it. So, um, that was really awesome. I did it all in a speedo. Um, and yeah, I mean, when was that? That was like probably 2009 maybe. Yeah. 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 Wow. So when did you realize that um, this could be a career? Because obviously at that point it wasn't, but yeah. was, what was the thing that's like, you know, actually I could do this as a career. Yeah. So again, like I said, I was very financially driven and um, you know, I grew up in a pretty, I just always knew I needed to like make money. And so when I graduated college, I said, I'm going to do triathlon one year. And if I make $5,000, I'll do a second year. Mm-hmm. And I did. Mm-hmm. And the second year I said, if I make $20,000, I'll do another year. Mm-hmm. And I did. And the next year, 50,000. And I did. Mm-hmm. And I kept making these benchmarks for myself. And I hustled. Mm-hmm. I went to Interbike. Do you guys remember that in Vegas? Oh, yeah. That was great. I went, yeah. I went to the running event. Every race I did, I was like recruiting or I was like, trying to promote myself to 
the the companies that were in the expo. Um, there was this one company called Beat Performer. It was a beet juice company uh, at Rev3 Knoxville one year. And I went up to the guy, his name was Doug. He owned the company. I said, Doug, if I win, he goes, do you like beet juice? And I was like, I love beet juice. I just can't afford it. It's so fucking expensive. <laughs> he, and I was like, if I win this race, will you sponsor me? And he said, sure. Because I just look like this sorority girl, right? right. I won the race. <laughs> and I got a great sponsorship from them. They sponsored me my whole career. Still really good friends with Doug. Um, and, and that's kind of how I did my career. So like, how did, I don't, I would say I still don't believe that I was this amazing athlete, but I believe I had the whole package of knowing how to make a career out of it mm -hmm. and knowing how to make money. So once I started figuring out how to make money in the sport, that's when I knew I could make it a career. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily to me that I needed to be the best. I needed to be consistent. I needed to race a lot. And I needed to promote myself the way sponsors wanted me to. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of cracked that code, right? Mm -hmm. um, because at the end of the day, a sponsor wants you to sell product, yep. mm -hmm. right? They don't really care about anything else. And I figured that out and I knew how to get what I wanted. And like, that's how I was able to make up to 200 grand racing, never racing in a world championships, right. never went to a world champs because I knew the races to do and I knew that if I went and raced in China, they'd pay me to show up. Like I just kind of figured out the system. Um, and so I would say I was like not the best racer on the course, but I was the most intelligent, like in business savvy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I'm kind of working with my athlete, Justin, who's, you guys know, um, Justin Reale, who's going pro now. And we're kind of navigating that. Like, how do you want to make this a career mm -hmm. or do you want to get the best out of like to see where you stand amongst the best mm -hmm. you have to choose kind of which route you wanted and I didn't care where I stood amongst the best I wanted to make a career out of it and I did oh I love it and yeah there, that sport business side is really an interesting side uh, to get involved in and that's neat to hear that story so at what point did you were you making money and you said okay I'm going to be a professional triathlete at what point did you have to turn pro or did you have to turn pro I was pro straight out of college. I, um, I, I raced amateur for two races. Mm -hmm. I did Augusta 70.3. I went like five hours 30. That was my first 70.3. And then I did, um, Florida 70.3 when it was at Disney world. And I think I went 442 and I won the race as an amateur. And then I qualified by, um, an ITU draft legal race in Claremont, Florida. And so I qualified for my pro license three times. And so at that point I was like, okay, I guess I'll take it. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do very, I did a handful of races as an amateur. So I guess I've been, I was a pro triathlete pretty much my whole time. That's fantastic. Yeah. So then what ultimately made you or persuade, persuade you to switch to coaching? Cause you know, it, it seems like a lot of, former pro uh triathletes get into coaching what was the what was the impetus for you was it financial or was it what, what was it that's a very interesting question um and so I raced you know I had a 10-year uh long career racing professionally as a triathlete uh then I had a um doping sanction for THC marijuana okay. Mm -hmm. And I got a three month suspension for, so it wasn't a big deal. Like I could still race, right. um, but I lost every sponsorship in 24 hours, like mm -hmm. in 24 hours. I went from making a ton of money to no money. It was like the crypto crisis. <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> triathlon. And, um, you know, guys, if, if you guys met me in 2019 and you said, what's the one thing you do not want to do after triathlon, I would say coaching. <laughs> I, I had no, I was like, I will not be that pro who's a coach like ever. Um, but while I was on the tail end of my racing career, my husband at the time was coaching and Justin Reale, um, the a local from Vegas, he wanted my husband to coach him, but my husband was working for a company where the rates were way too high. Okay. So he couldn't afford them at the time. 
And so I coached Justin secretly. So Justin thought my husband at the time was coaching him, <laughs> but I was actually coaching him and he had no idea. And Justin was paying only a hundred bucks a month or something like yeah. super cheap. Right. And, um, then Justin goes and wins Hanu 70.3 in 2019 out of nowhere. Like this guy just comes off the scene. And then I was like, Hey, Justin, I was your coach. <laughs> <laughs> and because I was just doing the training peaks behind the scenes, you know, like, um, and then I was like, you know what, when he won that race, it was so much more rewarding than me ever winning a race. Mm -hmm. I felt so fulfilled by that. And I didn't, a feeling that I didn't get out of racing for myself. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I really was addicted to that feeling and I wanted to feel that more. Right. And so, when my doping sanction happened, I was like, this is a great op time for me to kind of like go into coaching, you know? And I would say in triathlon, I didn't have bad coaches, but I definitely didn't have good coaches. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I never really, I just ran a 109 half marathon and I never ran under 120 off the bike. Mm -hmm. And that just doesn't make sense. No. You know, like that's, and I just don't, now that I'm coaching and I understand anaerobic and aerobic capacities and how everybody's kind of different. Um, you know, I, I, I understand that I naturally am a very highly anaerobic type athlete and I was doing way too much work over threshold all the time. And that's why I never really was able to dial in that 70.3 type racing because I, I couldn't, I couldn't hold power for a long time. Right. But I could hit eight by five minutes over threshold, right? I could fake those types of workouts. And that's all I was getting my whole career. And I was wondering what happened? Why, what was that disconnect? And so then I really started immersing myself in education and consulting with some of the best coaches around the world and asking, what are you guys doing? Um, the year Jan Fergino and Ann Hogg both won Kona, they were coached by the same coach, Dan Lorraine. I go, how does the same coach coach both champions? What, the, what are they doing? Got on the phone with him, consulted with him for months, right? Learned what they were doing. Um, and then the Norwegians busted on the scene, got on the phone with those guys, try to figure out what they're doing. Um, and then all of a sudden, this is becoming education for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm really enjoying actually learning about it. And I'm, I really enjoy educating my athletes. So Yes, I'm coaching, um, but it kind of just fell into my lap. Um, and I'm just, I feel like I have a lot of experience from racing in the field, right? For mm -hmm. a long time, internationally, amateur, professional, all distances. Um, work, I worked with Dave Scott. I worked with Simon Lessing. I worked with Chris Lieto. I worked with Cliff English. Like I've had some of the top coaches. And so I feel like I have a lot of tools that a lot of people don't have mm -hmm. um, just off experience and the, and the education piece and my biology degree. Um, it just called it kind of made sense, you know, and then that business part of me where I kind of know how to make a living just being an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, so I took the, the risk and, and started my own coaching business and um, it's doing very, very, very well. Awesome. And let's get the name of your coaching business. We're called Black Sheep Endurance. <laughs> and where did <laughs> that I'm come from? I'm the Black from? Sheep of everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I love it. And I, I love this approach that you're taking in terms of learning. And obviously you were learning as an athlete from your coaches and your experiences, but now learning to help someone that uh, it seems to, to change the focus of it a little bit, but how has that learning ultimately impacted your decision to get back into running? Yeah, so I've, I learned and I, I really have um, immersed myself in the sport with new, in the nutrition side, the training intensity side, like knowing about lactate. I never had used the word lactate in the 10 years I raced no. because no. I was always a very blind athlete. My coach told me to do it. I did it. I didn't ask why I just did it. Mm -hmm. And that's why I put such an emphasis on to, with my athletes. And I'm like, if you don't understand why you're doing this, or you don't agree with it, please ask me because it's very important to me that, you know, um, 
so uh so I all during COVID and during my pregnancy, I have a two-year-old now. Um I was just running and I um I was a little I and I wasn't getting injured and I was running very high mileage and I was like this is interesting. And my ex-husband at the time was like you really should get a coach because you're going to get injured. And then I was like okay. And so I hired a coach um his name was Tom Schwartz and he was very uh he's very data driven, you know, scientist and um he started, you know, started educating me and I started learning about the single sport of running. And it was very intriguing. And so then I was like, I want to be a 5k track runner. Like, like take, take me from this 70.3 athlete that I've transformed into. And, and I want to be a 5k runner now, like let's tap into that anaerobic system. Cause I wanted to see how he could manipulate the training, like how it, what would be different. Right. So we did that. Now I'm doing the marathon and I'm seeing now how the training is like completely different. Um, and it's just all interesting to me. So I got into running. I hired a running coach just to learn running hmm. so I could teach my athletes and coach them better. I didn't hire my coach to like, see what I could get out of it. I hired him purely to be an experiment so I could see like what we needed to do. Cause if I knew how to take a 5k runner to be a iron man and an iron man to be a 5k runner, I was like, that's pretty good. If you know how to do those changes and turn the dials. Right. Hmm. And so that's why I hired a track coach. And then I happened to be fast. And then I went to Olympic trials for the 10K. And that was such a great experience. And now I'm running a marathon next weekend. <laughs> I think it's interesting you mentioned like turning the dials, you know, because this is something that we've talked about on this podcast before is, you know, a good coach being able to recognize the physiology of a person and understand that there are dials that you can actually you can turn and it's not just more work and it's not just more this or more that it's understanding where they're at and then prescribing it. And right. this is not something that like, um, an AI, you know, program can do or some just random book program can do, right? Like this takes intelligence. And it sounds to me like you're, you're you've immersed yourself in that intelligence and, you know, you mentioned lactate. I'm, I, and then we talked to Justin about, you know, he's telling, telling us all about his lactate testing that he's doing. And, you know, that is like some really cool, cool stuff to be able to actually move those, move those dials. Right. Yeah. And, um, and, and you're exactly right. Going from 5k to a marathon. It's an interesting thing because it's, you're moving the dial, but you don't have to move it that much. Right. No. It's both aerobic, but it's just changing that lactate there, the LT one, just slightly one way or the other. And and the, and, the, and the impact on, especially on an elite athlete is significant, is quite significant. Right. right? So how did you, how did you learn about doing this? Cause like, this is not something that just kind of falls, it falls from the trees, you know? Yeah. I mean, again, it goes back to, um, consulting with the coaches, right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, First, I, I just got into the, you know, first, let me first say the lactate testing and endurance triathlon, especially right now is the, all the hype, right? Everybody wants to do it. It is, but very few understand what it actually means. Exactly. If you don't know first, if you don't even know how to take a proper sample, yeah. you're screwed. Yeah. And that's about 95% of the people. So well, you're coaching remotely and you're having the athlete do it themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. So if you get any droplet of water or sweat or contamination done. Right. Yeah. And so first you have to know how to do it correctly and be very patient and skilled and very like serious about it. Um, and then second, you have to know when you get a reading, what, what do you do with that? Right. Because it just, what, how do you adjust the intensity? What does it mean? Right. What is it? Are you out of shape? Like, did you just take a gel? And maybe that's why your lactate spiked a little bit. Like you have to kind of know all of this stuff. Are you a little dehydrated? And so, um, I, I've been studying this now for probably two years, just on my own, because I'm curious, but I've, I'm also working with the Norwegian Federation for my own marathon training. 
and I'm kind of being mentored by them. And so I'm also learning and teaching Mm -hmm. my athletes. Um, But a lot of it, you know, guys, is just listening to podcasts, reading scientific journals online, and a lot of trial and error in my own training. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, like the lactate is a dangerous thing unless you know what you're doing. It can be more harmful than good if you don't know what you're doing. Yep. And no, so no. I only have a couple of using it. Even doing VO2 testing can be very dangerous. I know, exactly. And exactly. If, if you don't That's know what you're doing thing. and what you're getting and what it means, and even like you were saying, like the influence on so many other things, it's the same with lactate, like what you've done during the day, what your stress level is like, what your cortisol level is like. Did you just take a gel? What did you have for breakfast? Did you train in the morning and then come and do the test and, or, and then do it later? These yes. all have influence on this. And you know, you're one hundred percent right. And I, I actually have an athlete that I that I've been consulting with a little bit, and he wanted to buy a lactate meter. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Are you are you sure you're going to go down this road? And and uh, I almost dissuaded him from it because I'm like, I don't think you have the patience to do what you need to do to get this right. To get well, it right. And, yeah. And lactate testing is expensive. Yeah, well, it's expensive. Yeah, one test strip is like two dollars. Yeah. Yeah. It's very expensive. Every test is two bucks. Yep. And um, and every time you get a piece of sweat in it, there's two dollars gone. You got to do it again. Yeah. You got to do it again. I know. Today I had this thing. Sorry, guys. I'm looking at my computer charger. Oh, I don't know where it is. <laughs> um, every day, like this morning, I did lactate testing, and we're talking about we were t- before we went live. We were talking about sleeping, right? Yeah. And yeah. I took this pill last night, This and it's it's called um, Adorax. It's an antihistamine. You would take it for allergies, you know, a rash. Mm-hmm. But it also is sometimes prescribed off-label for sleep. Mm-hmm. You know, there's some things that work for a couple things. And um, you guys, I was sweating last night. My heart rate was so high. This morning I woke up, my resting heart rate's like 72. I was like, am I dying? <laughs> and I go do these this workout today. And it's very, it's very normal workout. It was 10K of work at LT2. And my lactate is reading 6.8 millivolts. Yeah. And mm-hmm. usually my lactate at this intensity is like 2.3. Okay. Yeah. My heart rate's super high and I'm just freaking out. And you know what? It's because my body was under so much stress from that medication. It wasn't used to it. And your lactate just fuck, just goes high, right? Sky high. And like, if you can't put those pieces together, then you're like losing your mind, mm-hmm. you know? And then on the flip side, um, I often do double threshold sessions. So I'll do a threshold session in the morning, um, five by 2K at LT2. And then in the evening, I would do 10 by 1K at LT2. And um and the evening when I do that, I cannot get my lactate over 1.3 mm. ever because I'm so glycogen depleted from the day, yeah. right? Because I, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I've already trained my workout in the morning. I don't feel great. Honestly, I'm a single mom. Like I just don't have time. Like I just don't feel great during the day. I do most of my eating at night. Mm. And so by the second session, I just can't get my lactate up. So like if someone didn't know that they would keep ramping the the pace, right. And get injured. But I have like, you know, uh, I don't athletic intelligence, I guess, to understand, well, my lactate's not high because I'm extremely glycogen depleted right now, you know? So people do the same with heart rate and power, right? There, there, there are things that can, can influence both those, especially, especially heart rate. Yeah. And they say, Oh, well, my heart rate is elevated. So I'm going to go slower and not understanding, well, all these other things during the day increase your heart rate. Yeah. Or, or, or suppressed it on, on the other side. And they become um, you know, so, so into the data that they don't actually know. And l- they're not intelligent enough to listen to their body and figure out the reason why they're doing, or why that response is happening. Yeah. And, I, and I think lactate is even more sensitive than the, than, than the other measures. Lactate is so sensitive. Yeah. But you know what? It's such a great tool if you can figure it out. Yeah. Not my computer charger. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, that's right. Well, that, that's pretty funny. I, and usually we'll get uh, Cosmo, uh, Ted's dog, to make an appearance. So 
Yeah, there's always something, man. With yeah, me. it is. Uh, That's great. But the lactate, you guys, I mean, we could do a whole, we could do, maybe we can do another episode on that. Yeah. We should. You know, we actually have uh, experimented with lactate. Both John and I have done so, quite a bit of testing with lactate. We put many, many holes in each other's ears and fingers. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, I think that would actually be kind of fun to, to, to see what you're doing. So let's, 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 let's plan on that for sure. Let's plan sure. on it because I'm doing the marathon. One last note on that, that we can move on because we could talk about this till tomorrow, yeah. but I just ran a half marathon yeah. um, and I've never done a half marathon before open. And based off lactate testing, we knew exactly to the second per K I was able to run. Yeah. And I did exactly what mm -hmm. we thought I could. Well, and I was reading on your interview, you actually were, was this the race you were running off of the power meter? I was using the power. Yep. 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 And, and so that's the, that's the kind of the secret weapon here, right? Is knowing your lactate, but also, and knowing the power at that lactate. So when it was windy or was, you know, something is different, you know, you're going uphill, you're going downhill, you're controlling the power, which is ultimately the surrogate for um, the lactate at the time. Exactly. So it's knowing your power, lactate, heart rate, pace, and yeah. being able again to have that athletic intelligence to make decisions based off all of those metrics. You're going to um, be a, you're going to be a deadly woman when uh, next year Abbott comes out with the uh, lactate continuous lactate meter that they're talking about. I know. I saw that. I'm very maybe I can get one. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, we wouldn't. Why I said that is because very few people will understand it to the level that you understand it. And can you imagine if you had if you had lactate measuring as you're running? Oh, you. I mean. You would have your best performances always, yeah. you know. If you like, know what you're doing. If you know what you're doing and how to adjust it, right? And so, anyways, I have this marathon next weekend on December fourth. Yep. We we know the exact power I'm aiming for: 260 watts. I'm aiming for 330 per k. Um, and in the mid one in the 150s to 160 heart rate. And like, well, let's see how I go. And then let's let's do another follow up and. Let's, I would love to like compare what I thought, you know, the data going in and all the data points we had and then how the actual outcome came in a race, so, like a marathon. That's so and I know, and I know we're kind of beating this a little bit to death and we're going to talk about it more, but I'm really interested because this marathon is going to be at sea level, right? Yes. So then that's the confounding variable, right? Is, yeah. is your, your heart rate and your, not just even your heart rate, but just your response is going to be different, especially yeah. because we're coming down from altitude. So I don't know about you, but whenever I go down, down to sea level, man, I think I'm going to go like, you know, for me, four, four minute K pace. The next thing you know, I'm at like 345 and I'm feeling the same. Oh, for sure. For yeah. sure. And then but but my race, legs can't handle it. <laughs> in a race, like a marathon, I think it's better to be conservative going in. So like, I know I can run a 227 flat yeah. marathon at altitude. So I should be able to do that. And you should feel comfortable. That should feel comfortable. And for my first marathon experience, that's what I'm going for. I'm not going to get a great, like a 227 is a great time, but like, I really think I'm able to run a 224, but I'm not going for that the first time. I'm just going to go run conservative, get some data, and then we use it towards the next one. Awesome. So oh, what I, what I love about this is this discussion of running power. And uh, in our podcast, we've talked a lot about cycling power and maybe just a little bit about running power. So I, I would love to have you back on where we talk about running power and, and how to measure that and what it means and then your experience with it. But I want to I want to go a little different angle right now. And I'm curious, you've done a lot of learning and consulting and, and tapping into expertise of, of other other folks. How do you translate that to your athlete or how much knowledge do you try to pass on to your athlete versus just using that information to guide them? Yeah, that's a good question too, because there's a slippery slope. Well, first of all, triathletes are very type A. So you have to make sure they're not getting too obsessed, mm -hmm. right? And then overanalyzing because sometimes that can be a really big downfall for people. Mm -hmm. So first I kind of identify the athlete. Can they handle this information or can they not? Mm -hmm. Some people cannot. They, they cannot take the information because they will overanalyze it and self-sabotage. Mm -hmm. So those people I'm very vague with. Mm -hmm. um, I just give them the plan and I know the why, but I don't explain it. <laughs> because, 
but then there's other folks like Justin, um, and, uh, I, he wants to know why, and mm -hmm. I explain it to him and it's, and then those relationships are more of a, um, more of a two-sided relationship. Mm -hmm. Cause there's oftentimes some athletes are like, Hey, I know this is what you want me to do, but this is how I feel. And I think this is actually what I think I need to do. I don't think coaching is a one-way street. I think it's a two-way street. And I'd like to collaborate with my athletes and know how they're feeling. And, so, and, and, you know, even Justin, what do you think you're capable of riding in the race this weekend? Mm. Okay. And he'll tell me and I'll be like, okay, well, this is what I think. And this is why. Right. And so I would say for my athletes who are very, um, the more, I don't want to say elite because I don't like saying elite, but the ones that are very interested in the why, in the science, in the details, and they are able to handle that information mm -hmm. and kind of let the ego go. Mm -hmm. Those people I really like to go in deep with because I love explaining mm -hmm. why, because I'm a very big um, proponent of intensity control. And all triathletes want to go too fast. They want to go too hard. They want to exit that workout feeling tired and like they deserve something, you know, and where really you should walk away from a workout really never being that tired, unless maybe we're doing a VO2 max block, which is kind of rare. There's not many athletes who need that, right? Especially most, not long distance. Yeah. Yeah. And most, most talented, I don't want to say, I don't like the word talent either, but most people that are pretty athletic already have really high lactate production, mm -hmm. right? So we don't need to work on that. Mm -hmm. So rarely does a pretty good athlete need to be doing any work like that ever. And so that's what I have to have my athletes understand is like, you, this should feel very easy. Mm -hmm. And there's some, for some reason, triathletes or maybe all endurance athletes think they need to be tough and like suffer. And that's just really not the case. Mm -hmm. And so that's where my education comes in. I think more is slowing down and backing off and why that's going to help them later on. Right. Why that's going to help them burn more fat. Why we're going easy to build mitochondria, right. Not like just to blow our glycogen and like bonk, you know? And so it's kind of explaining that to people. Um, so I would say I try to keep my roster not too big because I do spend a lot of time talking and educating and, and making these plans for people so they can understand them. Because I do think when they understand it, they execute better. No, oh, I'm so glad you brought this up because, uh, recently, uh, there, you know, one of your athletes was uh, on Facebook and someone wrote, Oh, you're one of the hardest working athletes. And he wrote back and said, not anymore. And then it became known that he was being coached by you. And so I love this phrase that you just use intensity control. So I'm curious. I mean, like you said, a lot of triathletes will tend to do this hard, hard, hard all the time. Mm -hmm. And how, how long does it take you to convert someone who's a really a high performing athlete to begin with, convert them to something where exercise is enjoyable and, and almost easy at that point? Well, I will say when I start working with an athlete, I make my expectation, like, if you're not going to do the plan exactly how it is, I don't have any interest in coaching you mm -hmm. because I only want people who are serious. You don't have to be fast, mm -hmm. but you need to be there to get the best out of yourself. And by that, that means you're buying into my philosophy mm -hmm. and my plan, mm -hmm. right? Um, I would say it takes about eight weeks to kind of unfuck somebody <laughs> like <laughs> you have someone coming in who's doing the group rides the zwift rides the master swims like yeah, you know yeah. the racing all the time mm -hmm. it takes about eight weeks to undo that damage yeah. and then we can kind of start building on that um but this training is so mind-numbing because it's just kind of like not that hard all the time but it's really boring type stuff and i tell people my program is not entertainment my program is high performance so like, this is not that fun. <laughs> you know what I mean? But it's also not like breaking down your muscle fibers. You're not getting injured. You're not getting sick because we're doing the right intensities. And if you're training at the right intensity, it should be very sustainable and you should really never get injured mm -hmm. um, if you're eating properly and doing all of those things right. So yeah, when someone comes in, 
it takes about eight weeks to get them kind of in a rhythm, mm. I would say, and to start seeing adaptations. Mm. Mm-hmm. And if they can get through that eight weeks of running really slow under 140 heart rate, that pains people, man. They can't do it. <laughs> um, you know, not going to the master swim, slowing down no. and um, actually training at race pace, you know, mm-hmm. um, then that, the, you know, that we usually have a really high rate of success if they, and it's not rocket science. It's not like I'm over here doing something so genius. It's just science. I mean, it's just numbers, you know, and it's just understanding the metabolisms and the different capacities and understanding the body. Um, because I think a lot of triathlon coaches just give athletes what have traditionally worked for them in the past, right? Or it's worked for one athlete. And so they think that a plan applies to everybody, but everyone is very different. Um, so um, like even like Luigi, who's a Las Vegas try guy and Justin, very different athletes. Luigi has a very high aerobic capacity. Justin now has a very good aerobic capacity, but when he started, his lactate production was so high, like his, his, his VO2 max was like, not that great. It was okay. You know? And so we've really, we spent three years really working on that. Justin was always, a um, what are those people called that like race every practice? Like, you know, the, the ones who race and training, like he always wanted to win everything. Um, and he's really, really, really changed a lot and it shows in his racing. You know, it's interesting. The um, you're, you're you're not the first person that we've had on this podcast that's talked about this. And John and I, we talk about this all of the time. That this is truly an aerobic sport, and yeah. you have to train the aerobic system, and you have to train volume, and you've got to get it right, like the volume right. And you cannot be consistently adding intensity, intensity, intensity. You're going to get injured. And yep. you're not going to be as successful as you could possibly be, especially in 70.3 racing and above. Yeah. I think if you're going to be a sprint training, a sprint specialist, and that's all you want to do. Different, a little bit different story, even though we, we've talked about this is still being very, a very aerobic thing doing a sprint triathlon, but it's probably not as paramount as if you want to go set, you want, you want to do a 70.3 and you want to set a PR, you got to slow down to go fast. For sure. I mean, Jakob Britson. 1500 meter world record holder, aerobic yep. sport, 1500 meters, right? And I like to say, I explained to my athletes, we're trying to raise the floor instead of raising the ceiling, right? Mm-hmm. So I don't care. I'm not here to get you fast. I'm here you here to get you to sustain power for a very long time and feel comfortable. But it's not, but it's not glamorous. It's right. not glamorous. And, and you got to get away from that. And we, we talked about this before too, the Zwift ego or the Strava, sorry, Strava ego, where you're posting these unbelievable workouts. It's like, you know, that's, you, it's not sexy to put out, uh, you know, I ran 10 miles at 10 minutes a mile. No, it's like, it's like most triathletes want to do Ironman, but they want to do 800 meter training. <laughs> I'm sure I love that. Yeah. And it, it, it I don't know. Like, that's just not how it works. <laughs> like it just doesn't work. You don't get fast. Yeah, no, it's um, not. And you know, what gets you fast is six by 30 minutes at Ironman Watts, right on the bike every single weekend. Yeah. Like how boring is that? You know, it's terrible. It's mentally mind numbing, but if you want to be really good, that's what it takes. If you want to just participate and have fun, that's fine too. But just know, like, you're not going to get the most out of yourself. Like, and, and that's okay too, right? Because some people that it, this is the social part, right? So they want to do the group ride. They need the master swim team. They, they need to run with somebody else because this is their social outlet. And that's great too, but exactly. they're not going to get everything that they can get out of themselves. Yes, exactly. When I just signed on with my coach, his name's Arlid Tavita. He was the coach of Christian and Gustav. Right. Um, and he said, if I coach you, you will no longer work out with anyone else. <laughs> like, and that's not because I don't want you working out with anyone. No one is going to want to do this training with you. <laughs> and I've done this whole marathon build alone and I've enjoyed every single second of it because I know it's, it's blue collar, hard work, 
that is being that I'm it's productive. Like I see adaptations happening right in front of me. And that to me is what I personally want. But again, like you said, we're not here to like talk bad about people who do want the Zwift social. That's just another route. And and that's just, but that's just not the style I'm coaching. That's just not my, you know, my expertise, I would say. I think in the last two years, I've had, I've done a ride with, with more, with, well, with one other person five times. Yeah. <laughs> and it's been, it's mostly because no one wants to ride with me because I'm going, you know, this pace, this heart rate for hours. And it's not, it's not fun. Sex, it's not sexy. Yeah. It's not fun. It's, it's not, not fun. fun. And, um, but actually the thing is, I actually find it fun. And so I'm a sick person, right? <laughs> Yeah, but you know what's fun? Winning. <laughs> no, there's nothing there, 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 there's nothing more fun than winning. And uh, un- unfortunately, to my detriment sometimes. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is, you, uh, Lauren, you brought up the issue of, of injuries and staying injury-free. And this is also a way to do consistent training where you're not introducing a higher risk of injury. So maybe talk a little bit about how you get your athletes to the start line healthy and ready to go and not not battling some injury at that point what else are are there some secrets to what's the secret sauce to staying injury free well i don't really have that many secrets <laughs> i would say nutrition is a big one i'm big into fueling during sessions a lot of people like skip the fueling i i look at fueling as already starting that recovery for tomorrow mm-hmm. um even me at the end you know sorry to talk about myself too much but i just it's just the only examples I have, but like, I will do a track set. And at the end, I'll take a gel before my warm down or cool down to start to make sure my glycogen's topped off for the next day, you know? And so nutrition hundred percent. Um, but it's, it's the intensity control. I mean, I know this is again, not a sexy answer, but it's just not breaking down those muscle fibers. Mm-hmm. And it's keeping it below or right at threshold. You don't really need to ever go over that for triathlon, mm-hmm. ever. Mm-hmm. Unless you're somebody who really has a very low VLA max, right? Like maybe you really do need some intensity. But again, then that's a very fine line because you can't overload that person with too much intensity. Mm-hmm. You know, so with me, how do I keep them injury free? Because I talk to my athletes every day. Like I'm a very hands-on coach. I want to know how they're feeling. If anything's wrong, I'm on the phone with them and we're nipping it before we, um, and I'm not afraid to rest people at all. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of communication with my athletes, a lot of transparency, nutrition, intensity control. And I would say consistency. I don't give days off and I don't give really off season. We're always training. We might um, ebb and flow like the amount of volume but I actually think taking breaks is really bad um, because I think your body likes that rhythm and routine and moving. And when you stop is kind of when you get those injuries, mm-hmm. you know, like even after an Ironman, I have people still very lightly exercising because they still need to move their muscles and get the junk out and flush their system out. Right. Um, I will say a lot of people disagree with me, but I, I, um, I don't really push strength training. One, because I don't know anything about it. So I have some athletes who want to do strength and I'm like, go, that's fine. But I'm not going to like, I don't know anything about it and I'm not going to pretend to. So if you want to do strength training, my only advice is to work with a professional because I do know like you can injure yourself doing things wrong. Mm -hmm. Um, Second, I mean, I like to say my strength training is doing just high volume or like low gear on the bike and like low intensity type stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, High frequency. I like my athletes to run five to six days a week, but that just might be 20 minutes on one day, right? Just to get their body used to that. Um, But I really think if you eat and sleep and and, and control your intensity, you really shouldn't get injured, especially Mm -hmm. in triathlon. You're just not doing any of the sports enough to get injured. Hmm. You know what I mean? Like you oh, shouldn't get injured yeah. 40 miles a week running. 
No, and, and this is, you know, one of our rules that, that we talk about a lot is there, there's three main rules to staying injury free and, and increased performance is consistency, consistency, consistency. I mean, yeah. that's, that's what you're, you're really preaching. And, and so this is, this is great. And I love the idea of having these long, you know, uh, day to day to day to day sessions, because if you are consistent and keeping that intensity low, that's, that's tolerable. Yeah. And your body just gets used to it. You know, where you go wrong is if you do these big workouts and like, then you take three days break or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, and then also like we were talking about the VO2 max testing, like, and I told you guys, I mean, fully transparent. I know some about VO2 max, but I don't know too much. All I do know is like, I think you can kind of tell the amount of volume one can handle though, by their VO2 max. Mm -hmm. Right. And like Justin, you know, he just did his, what was he? 76, 78, uh, 79 point or something. So I mean, oh yeah, he was like, we'll call it 80. <laughs> it was point, it was point six or something like that. It was close enough. If, if, um, and, you know, uh, I'll just tell you a quick quick thing we talked about a little bit last week and tell you this. J Justin, like everyone else, about a minute after he finished, oh man, I could have went 30 more seconds. Yeah, of course you gotta. But, but everybody says it. So. <laughs> yeah, but his RER was so high. There's no yeah, way was. he was maxed out. Yeah, he was he, he, he was, was maxed, maxed out. out. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. So yeah, seventy nine, which is the highest I think we've done in our lab. Yeah. Yeah, and so of course he can handle a lot of a massive load of volume, right? Yeah, if he was right. fifty, then yeah. I, you know, okay, that person, we got to look at the volume and make sure they don't overdo it. Yeah. Um. So, and then another thing is just having another thing I coach with my athletes is having. Um. Being strong mentally. Because that's a whole nother podcast. Mm -hmm. Like, I really tried to, I'm not a therapist, but like, we try to visualize every single scenario that can happen before a race, right? And what are you going to do if that happens? Um, so there's no like, you know, you know what to do in every situation and there's no anxiety because mm -hmm. anxiety is just not knowing, it's just not knowing what's going to happen, right? It's guessing. Right. And so I feel like if you have a plan for everything, then you go into these races feeling calm mm -hmm. um, and knowing that at mile 10 of the half Ironman, you're going to be suffering. Yeah. I don't care. You better be suffering. <laughs> you better be suffering. Get ready for that and get excited about it. Yeah. You know, and so it's coaching people for the mental component, too, because that's 50 percent of it. Yeah. Having confidence and doing it in training and knowing you can do it. Like when I send my athletes to the race, we know exactly the watts they can ride, the paces they can run. And we've done that in training and there's no anxiety about it. Mm -hmm. Right. The swim, a little different story. Um, but that's how I like to prepare my athletes. And, um, that's why I think they've had a lot of success. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And, and I've, I've seen it in the athletes that you're coaching that, that they know what they're going to do on race day. Uh, and, and if something does come up, I mean, we talk about triathlon often being problem solving. Yeah. Uh, that is, uh, th that is, that is something that's great to prepare for at all levels. Yeah. My best, um, one of my proudest probably moments as a coach is I, I started coaching this, uh, guy named Tom De Bruin in 2019 in September. And he came to me and I said, what's your goal? And he said, I want to win Kona. And I said, okay, I don't really like goals of winning a race because you have no idea what everyone else is doing. Right. And so I said, okay, Tom, let me figure out what that's going to take. Right. And so I did my research um, and he's 35, 39 age group. And I said, that's going to take you swimming under an hour. And at the time he was like a one Oh four three, one Oh four swimmer. Mm -hmm. Right. So I was like, we got to get this swim under an hour. You got to ride 265 Watts and you got to ride, run three hours. If you can do that, you will win your age group at Kona. He won his age group at Kona this year. Yeah. Swam 59, yeah. 263 Watts, 301 marathon. Wow. That was three years ago. We wow. made that goal and we've been working towards that for yeah. three freaking years. And yeah. like, for him to just execute exactly, I don't know. It was like one of my proudest moments. Mm. <laughs> so also when I said, you know, 
Justin goes, you know, Justin's about to do his first pro race. And he's like, I want to be top six. I'm like, no, Justin, we're not doing placing. We're going to say, you're going to swim front pack. You're going to ride front pack around 285 to 290 Watts. And we're going to run a 116. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to get the place you're going to get, you know? And it's like, that's how I like to approach races instead of like a placement. It's just breaking down each sport and what is our individual goal in each sport and executing each one. And if we do that, you'll probably get the result you want. And if you don't, well, someone was better than you mm. and that's too bad. <laughs> well, I love that because that that's part of your, what I'm hearing your approach in terms of being mentally strong is sometimes you gotta, you gotta start with what is the right goal? And it sounds like you do a great job of coaching your athletes to set the right goal and not just go for a place or what have you, because you can't control what, what's happening, what, what the other athletes are going through, or sometimes you may beat that athlete, but it may not even be. Because yeah, it doesn't matter if, 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 for example, if Justin gets off the bike and his plans to run a 116 and someone runs a 109, right? He's not going seven minutes faster. He's not going to beat that guy. It doesn't matter how mentally tough you are. No, it's just not there. Right. Yeah. And so you, you cannot, I, I, I've just had this conversation with so many people and they're disappointed. Oh, I finished fourth. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, good for you. You hit every number you wanted to hit. Yeah. And there's three people that have happened to sign up for the race that were faster than you that day. Yeah. Yeah. But you hit everything you wanted to hit. How can you not be happy with this? I know. And that's on the podium. Who cares? You did what we set up for. That's the hardest part of coaching, honestly, oh, is so people having these expectations of placing. Yeah. And you just can't, you know, Iron Man, some Iron Mans are so weak and some are so stacked. Yeah. We had no idea. The pro race is a little bit easier. And that's why I was telling Justin, I'm like, sign up for every single one. We'll look at the start list. We'll choose the ones that suit your strengths, mm -hmm. right? Like, and that's how we're going to do it. But as an amateur, you can't do that. You got to just guess, right? And um, and I also think as a coach, making sure your athletes have appropriate expectations is really important mm -hmm. because, you know, I have some, I had some people, I had, you know, hypothetically, someone comes in and they have a three hour, 45 minute uh, marathon and they want to break three hours. And I'm like, I'm probably not the coach for you. That's going to take EPO <laughs> like, or five or years. take a couple years, right? Yeah. Like that's not going to happen your next marathon. I'm sorry. Oh. And so also having those hard conversations with people and saying, I love that you have goals, but these just aren't realistic for this year and we need to readjust yep. um, because when you're in a race and you all of a sudden aren't achieving those goals or those high expectations, your mind starts negatively spiraling. And then that's why you like have a bad performance. Right. And so it's making very realistic goals. And even like going into my marathon, I'm making a very conservative goal mm -hmm. that I know is achievable. So I am not disappointed during the race. Right. And, um, I think having a coach give you those parameters is really important. I love that. Now, you're, you you mentioned you were your mother, a two year old, which congratulations. <laughs> How has being a mother changed you as an athlete and or changed you as a coach or maybe evolved uh, you in one direction or the other? Um, I think it's as a coach. Uh, I don't think it's changed me too much as a coach, but definitely as an athlete, I've just um, you know, I used to view training as like a challenge. Like um, I would get nervous for it. Like I wouldn't be able to sleep at night before a big workout or or whatever. But now that I'm a mom, I just view training as a reward and it's like a privilege and it doesn't matter. Like it's just extra. You know what I mean? Like if I don't, you know, the marathon coming up, if I get last place, no one in the world knows my kid still loves me. Like nobody cares. Mm -hmm. Nobody cares about what you're doing, except oh, you. We, we care now. Cause we're going to, we're going to look at the results just so you know. Well, yeah. But if I suck, you still are going to like me. You know what I yes. mean? It's That's like, no. <laughs> well, maybe we're not going to have you back on. I can tell you that if you finish last in this marathon. Okay. Deal. deal. Oh, that would be interesting. But if I finish last, something epic happened and we probably want to talk about it. Well, if you finish last, you probably won't finish. How about that? <laughs> but I think it's just, you know, just being a mom has just been like, I'm able to turn off 
yeah. I'm just, yeah. it's not always yeah. sports on my mind. And then yeah. I feel like when I'm the quality of, I guess the quality of my coaching and the quality of my training is much better because mm -hmm. I'm hundred percent in when I'm doing it. And then I'm a hundred percent off when I'm not. Yeah. And, um, I just have a lot more balance in my life. And, and I'm sure you do this like with your, is, is it a daughter you have? I have a son. Son. My older. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't have, I don't have children, but I read some stuff about this where when, when times get tough in a race, you can go to that, right? You can go to, you can go to your son and you can, in your mind, just put that in your mind, but that's the important things in life. And, you know, right. we all have these things and especially in longer distance racing where it gets tough. Mm -hmm. and you put that in your mind you put a smile on your face and you get through that rough patch do you do, you do that oh for sure mm -hmm. I yeah. I would say it's not so much like oh I get to see my kid like it's more like my life is still there after yeah. this no. and, that, that, and that's what I was getting at it wasn't that you get to see it, it was it was literally like this is the fulfillment of changes. my life mm -hmm. yeah and it, and it doesn't change right no no yeah. nothing changes if I have a bad result and I was on a walk today with a friend and we're talking about this sleep anxiety stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are we afraid of actually? Mm -hmm. What is it? Mm -hmm. Like, why don't I sleep? Mm -hmm. And I don't know because I'm not scared of failing. I'm not doing this for money anymore. My, my racing. Um, and I, I, I don't know, like, I have no idea what that is. And I really am still searching for that. Where does this anxiety for a performance come from? Yeah. Like, because I don't feel like I even need validation. I just had a great career in the sport. My coaching is speaks for itself. Like I have a beautiful son. Like, I'm just like, why, where does this anxiety stem from? And I'm still really searching for that and trying to figure that out. And I don't know why it's there. So if anybody knows, let me know. <laughs> this is such a great topic. And I, I think we need to have you back on and talk more about this topic. Uh, I, and, and a couple others that I've got notes down here. Yeah. Uh, but we are at our hour and I said I'd keep you about an hour. And so Lauren, you have been so generous with your time. This is really been awesome. fun. <laughs> so fantastic. And lots of, of great gems in this. We are very much encouraged. Uh, we're going to be uh, watching you racing. Well, actually, I, I, well, several of us will be doing Indian Wells at the same time. So we'll we'll uh, check in after the race and see how it's gone. But we're well, really at nine at nine twenty eight, you guys, I'll be crossing that finish line. All right. And when you guys are on your bike suffering, yeah. <laughs> Coach <laughs> Lauren is done. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> she'll well, she'll already have at least one gel in her system. Post race. Yes, yes. I, I plan on taking seven gels in my marathon. Oh my gosh. I didn't know that's enough. But, that's enough. Yeah. But, I'm gonna take, but, but it's like, one, that's a lot of energy, right? I'm going to take one every 20 minutes, but yeah. I've been doing that in training and I can handle it. So um, I also forget how fast you're planning on going because, like, when I would be consulting somebody on going like a 310, 320, that wouldn't be enough because it yeah. really is about time. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're trying to go under 230. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 227 is my yep. estimated time. So um, we'll see. And uh, guys, I had such a great time. I, I'm excited to be back next time with a beer. It'll be off okay. season. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, good, good luck to you. Seriously. Um, we Thanks. hope you make that 227. All right. Thanks guys. Awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks everyone.